we'll just say hello to everyone already. Yes. Um, <laughs> Yes, I think Mavan forgot that the mic was not muted anymore. <laughs> okay. Yeah, hello. So yeah. greetings, greetings. Welcome to the Fireside Chat number six. We are very, very happy to have everyone here, um, all of our panelists from all over the world, and also everyone who's joining us. We heard some, we even have some very brave souls from around Australia, New Zealand. It's very early in the morning. So thank you for that. And uh, yeah, so happy that you're here. Well. Yeah, you said everything. I think I, I need not to say anything anymore. <laughs> Normally I start, but okay. We'll talk about that later. That's Mavan El Motain. <laughs> He's the editor in chief of I... Silver Grain Classics. Good. So you go <laughs> and, on now. Okay, I'll just go on because I started. So now I'm just going to go on. Um, my name is Kara Schuler, and I'm the developmental editor of Silver Grain Classics. And uh, we just thought that we would introduce you to our magazine because there's always some people who join us who don't actually know our magazine yet. So I'm um, just going to tell you a little bit about it. We've just brought out our 10th issue, which means 1,030 pages, which is pretty impressive in two years. It's been, it's been a lot. Um, Mama's going to... Well, yeah, we got Ooh. still now 1,030 pages. It's a lot. It yeah. really was a lot of work. <laughs> some are <laughs> nearly to be sold out. Um, some others are available, but yeah, we're running out of some. Right. So now we can go back to that nice screen that uh, Andreas was putting up for us in the background. Um, yeah, that's the cover of issue 10. And uh, it's really nice for us to know that we are not the only crazy people anymore who are putting out a print magazine about analog photography. Some other people have joined with their publications and we think that's fantastic because each one of these publications has their own focus. But um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Silver Grain Classics because we really do try to be about the entire world of analog. Um, as a developmental editor, it's my job to make sure that we keep kind of a balance in our content. And uh, it's not just between portfolios, gear techniques, and community features, but also gender, race, formats, cultures, famous and unknown photographers, all that kind of thing. And I have to say, each issue really is a very big balancing act. So um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit as an example in this issue. So can we go to the next slide, please? The cover photo is obviously from Helmut Newton of Sigourney Weaver. Um, that was our big um, centerpiece portfolio this time. And instead of just kind of rehashing Helmut Newton, I tried to take a, a different look at his work by pairing him with the unknown photographer, Aoife, who he actually worked in her studio in Berlin. And she did not make it out of Germany when he did, which is why she is so unknown. She was an amazing photographer. And I am really thrilled to be able to bring this largely untold story out um, to a wider audience because it's very difficult to find information about her. Um, next one. And then right next to them, we have this young man, Ilan, who is traveling on a shoestring through the world. And uh, he was caught by the pandemic and was literally saved by care packages from the analog community. It's a really sweet story, completely unknown guy, um, but really nice story there. The next one is Scott Campbell. He was actually on the US national free diving team and he can hold his breath underwater for seven and a half minutes. And that's one of the reasons he gets these amazing photos because, you know, he doesn't have all the blub blub of all the equipment around him. He's just swimming like one of the other animals down there. Um, so it's, it's pretty amazing stuff he does. Uh, the next one is Alexander Tkachev. He actually grew up in the Ukraine. He lives in the United States now, but he was a dentist in the Ukraine for most of his life. And he does these amazing alternative process prints. Um, and then right next to him, we have Bruce Bonbaum, who is definitely not an unknown in the photographic community. He's been um, a huge supporter of ours from day one. Yeah. And um, he's obviously uh, one of the gurus of, of film photography. And we're always very happy to see, to have his thoughts in, in the magazine. So those are some of the portfolios. Then moving on to the gear, this is a, a great article from Mavan. Um, about the what happened to cameras during the 80s. It was really kind of a game-changing decade for, for gear. And uh, he had a really cute kind of interesting take on which cameras changed what and why. 
Um, then we had a great uh, article from Ludwig Hagerstein, who is actually helping us behind the scenes today. Thank you, Ludwig, along with Andreas, um, about bulk loading film, um, which is becoming uh, another you know, popular again these days. And he can, he had a really interesting take on why you would do that and what are the advantages and is it difficult? So that was nice. Then we had a couple of techniques. This is one is from Mavan. Why not shoot really on film instead of using some sort of preset for your digital camera if you're trying to get a vintage effect? <laughs> so, um, you know, he went back and just said the choice of film, but also the style of lighting affects that, that true vintage feel as much as the clothing. Then we have another article from uh, our friend Doug, who while he was doing CLA, he accidentally reversed the rear element on his camera but found that he really loved the results and thought it was uh, very inspiring. So he wrote a little how-to article about if you want to do something like that, it's really not that difficult. Then we had something for our cinematographers. Um, a totally crazy story from our friend Ignacio Benedetti about uh, Polaroid Super 8 film. Um, which did not exist for very long, but it brings together this Polavision, a black market in Spain and a psychiatric hospital. You really got to really read, <laughs> like read it to believe it. It's yeah. crazy. Um, then we have a community article from Northeast Photographic, which is a lab up in Maine. And it was a great story for the analog community because they went from a garage lab to a full-time business with their own headquarters and everything in two and a half years. Um, just recently. So that's what we're seeing all over the place right now. And it's really great. The last article I wanted to show you briefly was just, we always have um, uh, somebody from the online community who kind of tells us what they're doing. Uh, this last issue, it was Mike Padua and he was talking about all the great people he's met through his film things. But the issue before that, it was Nick Carver who is also joining us today. So um, we're always happy to have the, the people from the online community with us. Well, yeah, so after the small introduction for those who don't know us, um, let us get into the discussion, uh, at least into the first round. Um, we'll start with uh, Juhu in Finland. Um, he is the man behind Camera Rescue. Um, and um, yeah, they is uh, now the, the CEO and he lives in Tampere, Finland. And he's always around uh, in Europe and getting cameras from everywhere, especially if they are old and uh, he tries to save them and brings them out of the cellars and out of the attics. Um, well, with his team, they saved, um, th their goal is to save 100,000 cameras. And um, yeah, at the moment, they're trying also to train um, technicians to repair cameras in order to uh, preserve that uh, uh, skill and to save for the future of analog photography from the gear side. Well, hello, Yuho. It's nice to have you here. And uh, yeah, it would be nice to hear how did you uh, experience 2020 and uh, what can we expect in 2021? Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's uh, it, it's been a you know uh, interesting year for for sure. Uh, just. Uh, exactly a year ago where we're still driving to to a fair in the uk and got uh, stuck in in belgium and uh, germany as the the borders started to close around europe and uh, we had to drive quite fast in the autobahn with with our little ambulance and uh, so fast actually that the tapes ripped from the roof and uh, we had to replace them when we one, once we got back and uh, and we missed two boats, and yeah, it was quite a quite a ordeal. Um, but after that, Finland has been quite uh, quiet with with Corona, so we got uh, the good end of the stick in in many ways. But we have been also stuck in Finland, so we haven't been able to go uh, to. We usually do maybe six fairs around Europe in a year. And uh, even though that slide actually said that I, I'm, a, I'm the CEO, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I, I'm on the camera rescue project and then the, the store uh, has a CEO and then there is a, the head of, of repair teams and, and there's uh, quite a few companies that are 
integrated in this project and I I'm just happen happen to be the one that has a you know public face for the whole whole project um, and uh, well what do we do we uh, find cameras that have been forgotten uh, what uh, strikes me quite uh, like the, uh, all struck, uh, struck me a few few years ago was that I heard that in Germany alone, in this millennium, there was 27 million film cameras sold. And that means that there's 27 million cameras somewhere in Germany uh, that have been manufactured in this millennium that are film cameras. Uh, that, like, if you translate that into the whole of the European market, it means that there's uh, over a hundred million cameras somewhere. And when the analog community uh, worldwide is a, a few million people, it means that there, there should be enough cameras for everyone. Uh, even though now that we are finding them, 80 or 90 percent of them do not work the way they are supposed to, it still means that there should be working cameras for everyone uh, still findable. And then we get to the other part of the camera rescue project, which is actually fixing the cameras before uh, they find a new home. And that's what we've been doing. Basically, uh, we've been doing buying and selling for 10 years, but uh, the actual rescuing and repairing we've been doing for five years, roughly. Uh, and uh, we are now at 90, you can find it on camerarescue.org. There's a live uh, counter of how many cameras we are. We are now at 97,304 cameras that we've done. And uh, so we'll hit our goal, official goal of 100,000 cameras in somewhere in three weeks or so. So we're, we're doing doing still uh, around a thousand cameras already a, a week at the, at the moment. So it's, uh, it's getting quite uh, hectic. And, uh, but it's not only about quantity now, the kind of the big news for this uh, uh, day, and we'll, we'll release it officially on Monday or Tuesday, is that we're starting a school. And it's a camera technician school. It's, first uh, batch will be eight uh, people that will be first trained four months for becoming a camera technician that can use the testing machine and can understand how how to test if cameras work properly and then after that uh, there is a chance to enter a camera mechanic uh, system uh, which is a mentorship program that you, you cannot basically you know, uh, learn it from uh, as as big groups. You need a master uh, next to you teaching you step by step. And uh, after after that, in three years, you would probably be a, you know self reliant camera mechanic. And it's it's the first kind, this kind of school, uh, I believe, in in this millennium that has been uh, set up at least. So. We're quite excited about that, and that's the, the future of us once we've hit our 100,000 cameras goal. You are doing also a big removal uh, project at the moment. I can see you all the time. Uh, sometimes I think the last picture I have you was you were sitting on a chair in an empty room and you were thinking about the past. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we we to to do to bring this know-how and companies together we basically set up a, a old uh, um, kind of it was a hundred year old uh, kind of building with a lot of small rooms and the idea was to do education in a room by room basis but then once uh, cameras started flowing in a, in a way that we get usually one to two pallets of, you know, a big collection from somewhere of Europe uh, comes in a pallet. And uh, we were in three floors uh, without an elevator. And, uh, you know, every, it, it got very crowded and it got very uh, also uh, not optimum. So, so now we moved into an old uh, 
kind of factory warehouse that's a hundred years old too, but it has an, uh, an elevator. So, so <laughs> it makes it a bit easier and we're basically all in the same uh, uh, floor or the, the actual processing uh, people are in the, in the same floor and uh, me and our like guys that do internet, we can be a bit, uh, have a studio and start doing more YouTube. Uh, hopefully, and that might be a not cue for the next guy. <laughs> but especially the, um, uh, the the camera sales and everything during the pandemic, you were happy with that, or was that a, a good development? Well, for us, of course, it was uh, quite a good thing because there was um, um, well, the project gets funded from the sales uh, or the, the the company that sells the cameras. And uh, we could get, uh, they got quite a lot of sales as most shops around Europe closed for some time. And, and the DHL guys, you know, would deli deliver to cameras to your doorstep. And even if, if there was a full lockdown. So, so there, there was, uh, especially a year ago when, the whole of Europe went into total lockdown for a few months. It was it was actually quite quite big, and we had problems with you know so much sales. But then it calmed down and kind of normalized after that. And and uh, yeah, it's 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 it was a good year in in terms of that, and and that's also why we we can start a school basically. That's wonderful. I mean, I, that's one of the things that we definitely have been worried about. I think we spoke about that at the, the last Fotokina um, when we met you there, that everybody was kind of worried about not only the number of cameras, but who's going to be fixing them into the future. So that's really great news from you. Um, yeah. But I think we'll move right on to our next guest, who is Klaus-Peter Richter. He is the, he really is the CEO of Gossen. I'm sorry, that was my mistake on the last slide. For you. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> um, yes, but if you would have sent me your bullet points, then it's okay. <laughs> no, but uh, Klaus-Peter Richter is the CEO of Gossen and he has been since 2012. And anybody who reads any of our online content or our magazine knows that we are very, very passionate about getting people to really measure light properly with light meters. And, um, you know, if you're using an app, you might want to really rethink that, but we'll let him tell you about that. Um, he is definitely very experienced himself. We've had him here at our workshops and it's been really a joy to have him around and showing people, um, giving them the benefit of his, you know, many decades of, of experience. So welcome Klaus Peter. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you um, for letting me join uh, the community. And um, I want to come back. Gossen is uh, always alive and we have a lot of experience. Um, our history goes back to 1933 when the first light meter were manufactured by the Gossen company. And Gossen for Lichtmesstechnik is specialized uh, on light measuring only. Um, how was the 2020? We had uh, influence uh, from Corona as well, but uh, not so um, deep. Um, the only difference uh, that we can see, we have um, one part who is uh, the industrial measurement, and we have a second part uh, who is the light metering for photographic business. Uh, we still do this uh, business and our focus is more and more in industrial light measuring and also in our light laboratory, which we run for services. And um, there are rules and um, uh, standards uh, that you have to check your light meter regularly and send it to us every year or every two years or in applications like uh, in the um, airplane industry, um, you have to send them regularly uh, after six months uh, for recalibration. So that's one big part and it's a growing part because we are delivering more and more instruments. And uh, the unfortunately, the photographic business uh, is decreasing and decreasing. And I hope that in the future, the analog photographers 
will buy new meters instead of the old uh, meters that we have still on the market and uh, in some cases they uh, work and show you some um, figures but uh, you cannot rely on them. Um, we had last year uh, um, a change in the US business uh, so some participants uh, who are um, in US uh, maybe have problems uh, to get our products it's uh, we changed uh, the our uh, distributor in US because uh, the distributor decided to concentrate on his own brands so we had to look uh, on a new one and um, the business is going to our sister company who is in New Jersey it's uh, Tronitz and they will cover the US market as well with the light meters for the photographic business. Um, with the regard of the product portfolio, um, we had um, to discontinue our Spotlight meter Starlight 2 because we are faced to increasing prices and uh, especially for the optics, uh, they were tremendous. So um, in total, if we calculate the instrument, uh, it would exceed uh, that what uh, anybody will pay for it and we decided to stop uh, this Starlight 2. Outlook for 2021, uh, we are working on revitalizing the US business and expect good sales in that market. Uh, we expect that these restrictions uh, due to Corona will keep on uh, maybe at uh, the fourth or third quarter this year. And uh, hopefully the investment uh, in gears will increase afterwards and uh, we expect for the exposure meters a stabilized um, business uh, and we hope that the interest in analog photography will keep on growing and the customers of this segment will buy new meters instead of the historic ones that's what i told already <laughs> because it's our main problem um, i'm sometimes tired uh, asking questions about um, instructions uh, for meters that were 60 years old and we also get some requests for a service uh, and I always make a joke and so and I told the people okay uh, I have to dig out uh, the repairmen from the graveyard because the meters are so old that we cannot get any uh, spare parts any experience on it and uh, that's uh, one of the main problems we did the repair until uh, 2012 and afterwards we stopped with it because uh, in this old meter sometimes you repair uh, one uh, part of the meter and after half a year you get it back and uh, another part died so it's uncomfortable for the customer and it's uncomfortable for us and uh, when you look on the meters for example you can get a new one for a reasonable price they are not so expensive i always compare it um, when you buy a new camera, for example, um, then you spend thousands of uh, um, dollars or euros uh, for the new camera. A new light meter costs around 200 uh, to 300 um, euros or dollars. And uh, so it's not so expensive. And it's, an, let's say, it's, it's something uh, that you have for the complete lifetime. And cameras normally have a lifetime of three to five years. The new ones, the digital ones, I don't say the analog ones because uh, like we had before, they could be repaired and uh, they are functioning. Uh, but uh, the new ones are very expensive. And so the relationship uh, between the light meter that uh, you invest once in your life and uh, such a camera, which has a lifetime for five years uh, is uh, not so um, big. So I would propose everybody to buy a new one. It's not only why we want to sell something, uh, some new ones, but uh, it's always that what we recognize, uh, there are a lot of uh, old gears on the eBay or in the internet. Uh, the guys uh, buy this old gear for reasonable money. And afterwards they recognize that they don't work correctly. So, um, we get the requests or in some cases you don't get the batteries because they are uh, no longer allowed to sell um, and um, this is very difficult because there are 
some replacements available, but uh, the replacements um, are in the most cases um, expensive and the lifetime of the batteries um, that you can get uh, as a replacement are not so long. So um, if you buy a new one, uh, you're happy from the first day on because it measures correctly and uh, you don't have the problems. Uh, even if they don't have the old feeling of the analog light meters uh, that were expected, maybe for old cameras. But uh, I think the best way is uh, to invest in a new one where you can be sure that it can be serviced and you have it for a long time and uh, you, you get it repaired. Yeah, it's also a thing Yuho is now trying to, to um, save the future of cameras. And if we have a manufacturer or have several manufacturers still on the market who are still producing, it's good to keep that knowledge up because um, better to buy for 250 euro a new one than sending the same money in a used one, which is maybe later on just a piece of junk. Yeah, thank you, Peter. That was um, interesting. I think we have later on a lot, lot of time to go on with that. And yeah. um, we can get now to our next panelist, um, Nick Carver. And um, Nick established uh, Carver Photography in 2006. Um, he also runs online courses uh, on YouTube, also about light metering. That's uh, one of the points also interesting to see. Sometimes he's discussing, it's only not only that, um, um, single orientated. So sometimes he also talks about different whiskeys. That is also a very interesting thing to see. Um, and yeah, uh, everything photography focused on architectural landscapes from 35 to all other formats. Hello, Nick. Nice to have you here. And um, yeah, how was your experience in 2020? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, thanks a lot for having me, first of all. Um, you know, I was one of those lucky few that um, 2020 didn't have too big of a negative impact on me. And in some ways, it all the shutdowns and everything were actually kind of a, a benefit for me. Um, I have two kind of two avenues to my life as a photographer. I have the side that is purely for paying the mortgage. And that's the architectural side of photography. So I photograph commercial properties. Um, and then I have all the stuff I'm really passionate about and I care about, which is the analog photography community, uh, photographing things that I really want to photograph, um, you know, the YouTube stuff, uh, teaching, that's all very much stuff I'm, I'm more passionate about. But luckily, both of them weren't too affected by um, shutdowns because the, the architectural stuff that I do is in the real estate realm. So that was considered essential business. So I was able to keep working thankfully, because um, I don't know what I would have done otherwise, but uh, so I was able to keep working. And not only that, I almost shoot exclusively office buildings. So the offices were all empty. It made my job easier. I didn't have to shoot around people. I didn't have to coordinate shutting things down. Um, traffic was way better. I mean, <laughs> driving to, you know, anyone who's been to Los Angeles, uh, you know, doing a dusk shoot in LA, coming back to Orange County, it's 40 miles, but it could take two hours if there's, uh, if there's traffic. So you know, travel was easier for me. Uh, shooting was easier for me. It was all very good there. And then the, the other side of it with the YouTube, um, you know, so many people were stuck home and, and they were just looking for entertainment and just something to fill the time. I think we all were. And uh, I got quite a few emails from people saying that, you know, just having some entertainment to watch really helped them kind of get through, you know, the crippling boredom, I guess. So, <laughs> Uh, so that kind of grew a little bit too. And then I was able to do a few videos during, you know, the, the thick of the shutdowns and everything, put out some more content and, um, you know, with people being home as well, they can't go to school. They can't, you know, um, go out and learn photography as much hands-on in the field. So my online courses, uh, did pretty well through the time also. Um, and the, the main one that, uh, has been popular lately is the, the online course I have on, on metering. So, um, you know, uh, much like Peter was talking about, I'm very much into metering and, and getting precise and not relying on a, a phone app and, and just kind of getting sloppy with it. And there, there's definitely a trend, uh, amongst YouTubers. And, um, anytime I hear that I'm a YouTuber, I cringe just a little bit because I 
<laughs> I know, like it's good. I'm happy. I'm proud of it, but also I, I know it puts me in a crowd that's a, maybe a little. Um, but the uh, you know amongst the YouTube crowd, there's there's kind of this lean towards just I don't know sloppy technique and, and sloppy metering, especially and just oh yeah, rate your film three stops uh, lower ISO because just overexpose it. But uh, negatives are better when they're denser, and then they their lab is having to correct all their work and stuff, and it's just. Um, I, I'm really, I, I feel like I'm the only person out in a crowd sometimes shouting that like, no, you should, uh, you know, pay attention to box speeds. You don't have to use box speed, of course, but don't just blindly follow the guy on YouTube that said, you know, rate your 400 at ISO 50. Cause, um, that's some trend that's going on right now. So, uh, I I'm really trying to encourage people to, you know, get a little more technical about it. Cause not only is it fun, but you get better results, um, and embrace, you know, the, the process of going through metering, um, rather than, uh, you know, just kind of thinking you're going to figure it out by intuition, you know, uh, what, what settings are going to work in a given scenario. And, um, you know, granted I, I'm in a certain branch of photography where that's doable. You know, I do a lot of landscape. I do a lot of architecture. I do stuff that's very slow and it's large format and I'm taking my time to set up a shot. So I kind of have that luxury of, uh, promoting, you know, get your metering, um, spot on and take the time and, and really get into the process. But, you know, I realized that that may not be practical for wedding photography or photojournalism or something like that. Um, but, uh, I guess all that is to say that, um, you know, 2020 was, uh, okay for me, thankfully. And, uh, I'm very grateful for that. Cause I know that that wasn't the case for everybody. And then, um, you know, going forward in, in 2021, uh, it's going to be, you know, more of the same. I, I'm going to still be shooting buildings and still got bills to pay. And uh, I'm going to be putting out YouTube videos any chance I get. And um, I'm working on, you know, a couple of on location videos right now that'll hopefully uh, come out within the next couple months. And um, I've begun work on the next online course, which will be a uh, large format, kind of an introduction to large format, um, you know, talking about uh, tilts and shifts and shine fluid principles and all that kind of stuff for uh, for people so um, that's what's going to be coming this year well that does sound very exciting and uh, we are a big fan of your channel and also have been very happy to have you write for the magazine in the past and I'm sure we will be having you again so uh, it's nice to just have this format also to chat with you yeah absolutely uh, yeah, now I'll just move on to David Burnett, who actually really needs no introduction, but I'm going to take the opportunity anyway. Um, I mean, most people kind of know him in one form or another. <laughs> Either they just saw him on CNN, kind of he's got his dark slide in his mouth while everybody else is clicking away at 100 frames a second. And um, <laughs> uh, or you've just become aware of his work over the many decades that he has been taking amazing, amazing photos. Um, I told him yesterday that he's the person who made me realize that photojournalism is an art form. And uh, I will always be very grateful to him for that. Um, it says here he was declared one of the 100 most important people in photography, but what it doesn't say is that he got his first press card for $5 from some guy in a dorm room. <laughs> and um, he's got so many great stories and I just can't wait to have him introduce himself and show us some of his wonderful photos. So David, you are very, very welcome. We're so happy to have you. All right, so I'm unmuted, right? You are. <clears throat> okay, first things first. Um, the uh, Yuho, certain members of my family believe that those other thousand cameras you're looking for are in my studio. <laughs> that isn't quite the truth, but uh, I, I get a lot of static about it and I certainly, I, I have to say, I, I really need to think about maybe sending you a bunch of cameras because I still have a lot of film cameras that do not get much action anymore. And everything from, uh, I've got one old Nikkor mat and uh, a couple of T90s and a, just some good stuff in there. But that's, it's great what you're doing. That's the, definitely the Lord's work. Um, Klaus Peter, I, uh, I still have a Luna Pro from, it's, you said 60 years. I think mine's only about 50 years old, but it, um, 
it still works, but alas, you know, shooting more digital than I do uh, film these days, I haven't taken it out much, but I'm getting very inspired. This little hour has been really good, kind of moving some big mental boulders for me. And, um, and Nick, I was happy to hear that I'm not the only one who thinks that the Scheimflug principle is worth, is worth endorsing, even though most of the time that I'm using my tilt chip lenses, I am emphasizing the out of focus portion and the out of meeting uh, lines in a perfect way. I, I've been using it the other way and it actually has been a lot of fun, but it does cause you to start to think about the relationship of a lens and a film plane. So a couple of things. Um, I have been carrying around this, uh, the Iconta, I think it's a 521 Mark III. And these, these folding cameras from the 30s are really like the coolest thing. If you're a digital photographer, find one of these for a hundred bucks or a hundred euros on eBay. There's still a bunch of them out there. And if you haven't already got an old uh, Leica or Nikon or Canon, this is a wonderful way to try and figure out how to shoot eight or 10, six or 10 or 12 pictures per roll and really make everything come down to a photograph and not 50 photographs, which is what we can easily do with our, our digital cameras. Um, I mean, it does freak me out every time I have this wonderful little uh, 6500 Sony when I turn it on, I look on the back and it says I have 1816 images, full uh, density images left on the memory card. I immediately try and figure out, is that 50 or 500 rolls of film? But whatever it is, it's a lot. And it's, and it's the kind of thing that um, my French friends, I worked for Gamma in the early 70s. When I, uh, when I came back, to the States from Vietnam, is in Vietnam for two years working for Time and Life Magazine. And when Life Magazine folded, I joined the French agency Gamma. And I worked in France and all over Europe and in the States for a couple of years and hanging out with French photographers who were part of that really wonderful, exciting world of we're gonna go do it on speculation. We have good photographers. We're gonna do the story because the story is worth doing, not because we're waiting for an assignment from Perry Match or L'Express. We're gonna do it because the pictures will be there and the pictures will be good. And when the picture, and then you know, they would race to get the film back to Paris and race to get the film processed and edit from wet negatives and make prints from wet negatives and get the stuff over to Perry Match. 20 minutes before the guys from Sigma or SEPA would. It was really a fantastic time before all of the electronic stuff that's kind of taken over the last 25 years. But I can remember uh, like standing around in front of the, at the Elysee Palace, you're waiting for a cabinet meeting to finish. And as the cabinet ministers would walk down the steps, you'd hear, click, click, click. And there'd always be a couple of guys just going <laughs> and machine gunning it. And you, you know, you blow through 36 pictures pretty fast. And then you'd have a few of the more thoughtful photographers saying in a very uh, disgusting way, a reference to this wonderful French word of gaspillage, which is an absolute and total waste just 36 pictures in 10 seconds who needs that you know there's a reason you have a shutter button like take a photograph and then wait for another one but it's uh you know motor drives created this urge to see how fast we could shoot and i you know i'm certainly not immune from it from time to time but what i do love about the uh the zeiss icon and my Aero Liberator, which I'm getting my exercise just lifting this thing up this morning. This is a this is a three and a quarter, four and a quarter Graflex Super D that's been modified by a wonderful, I refer to him as one of the mad scientists, a guy named John Minix, 
who has put an aero ektar. This is the super fast lens from World War II reconnaissance cameras. And he's got it so that if you undo this, you can actually check your Scheimflug principle. <laughs> and it also goes side to side. So it's, this is the one that I had. And I have actually, I think a picture in here of me with this lens in, the, in my pictures. Um, at the impeachment hearings last year. It was a huge hit because nobody, it's the first time I had taken it to a televised event. And of course, when you're standing around before the witnesses come into these, well, an impeachment hearing is about as important as something gets in the US. And just standing around and I've got two or three of my Sonys here and a, something over this shoulder, but I'm holding this thing like a baby in front of me. And you're not really thinking about it, but the news channels are broadcasting live waiting for the action and they got nothing to shoot except the photographers who were standing around so it was all over the news about Burnett and his magic camera what is that camera and it was great because anything frankly I, I do agree that anything that gets you to talk about the fact that there are things other than the, the most recent cameras is really great one of the things I actually like about uh, with the, this little Sony is that it's the perfect match for when you're carrying an eight pound liberator uh, and all the, uh, the film holders for it, just to have a little something in case real news breaks out and you have to take a real picture with your digital camera because you know that you won't have time to flip the holder and uh, get charged up for another four by five. So, I mean, as is my want, I am, rambling here if you want to should we put pictures up and we can talk about pictures oh absolutely whatever because like. <laughs> yeah. i'm uh, gonna i'm gonna try and race through this stuff because i know we're um, we're trying to push it this was before i got my fake press pass this is john kennedy came to my hometown salt lake city and my mom who was involved in a woman's uh women's group the league women voters said why don't we go see the president and I had, I had borrowed a Petriflex from the camera store I worked for. And as he walked by, I shot about 10 pictures. And this one, uh, I looked at it when I got home and went out into the furnace room and developed the film that night. And it has what I've always described in my years working with the French is the three things you never want in a picture, which is Suzex flu et bouger, underexposed, blurry, and out of focus. <laughs> and all of those things in one picture. And I took that negative and I cut it into strips of five, put it in an envelope, and it sat in an envelope for 40 years until 1998. And I was asked to do a photo uh, show about the presidents. And I pulled this picture out and my push triax and AccuFine. After 40 years, I'm thinking, you know, it doesn't look quite as bad as it did then. I mean, it's it's not really blurry. It's just catching the motion of this dynamic president, and it isn't underexposed. It's just my attempt to be forceful in the way that I'm presenting. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it became a picture which I was able to say, yes, I photographed every president since JFK. So, next one. Um, in Vietnam, I spent uh, a couple of years working in Washington, D.C. and Miami for Time Magazine. A really good friend had gone to Vietnam uh, in the summer of 1970. And when he came back, said there's still a lot of freelance work. So I got myself together and I bought a one-way ticket. Someday this will be a country Western song. I bought a one-way ticket to Saigon. <laughs> and I thought maybe I would go for six weeks or so, and I ended up staying for two years. And in so many ways to me, I did, I did a lot of color work. I got my first color cover of Time Magazine uh, while I was there. But so much of this, the expression of black and white and the way Tri-X was like the film, it's really, to me, it's kind of the, the war photographer's film. It, it captures what you need to get ASA 400 is fast enough for almost every situation. And just 
always knowing that that film is going to work for you is really a powerful uh, thing to to be able to feel. Go ahead. So I think I have a few pictures here from Vietnam. Just this is a group, one of the last American combat units, 1971. I was a terrible note taker all these years. I never got anybody's name. And now 50 years later, I, I re really regret it. Um, this was in, a, in a, a hooch, which was a living quarters for soldiers. One day I'm walking through and sometimes just being the observer is enough to make a picture. Go ahead. Next, yeah, this was, at a show that Bob Hope, the American comedian, used to do all these uh, trips for soldiers overseas. And he came to Vietnam and did a show. And I found the show was kind of fun, but looking out into the audience, and these are the people who were these young men, mostly men, uh, cheering and hooting with, with like so much of their year had been in a really tough situation. It was the one chance they had to kind of express themselves at a show with Bob Hope and a couple of uh, beautiful young women. And of course, you know, Bob Hope knew who to take with him. This is Robert Kennedy a couple of years later when he ran for uh, president in 1968, just a few weeks before he was assassinated. Um, again, I, I became a Tri-X guy. I, I always had my, my Luna Pro with me, but I pretty much knew that it was like 125 at 28 and I would confirm it with the meter. But uh, I, had a friend, I had a friend who once told a great story about working in a studio. I can't remember, it was some famous photographer. I, maybe it was Arnold Newman, may have been Arnold Newman, but it was, like uh, first day working as an assistant in the studio. And uh, it's like, well, what do I do now? I said, well, okay, I want you to learn, uh, got to learn, we're going to be shooting this film. And it was like Ecta Color G or something. So said, ASA 64. I said, you got to learn um, the, how this film looks under artificial light. And they, he kind of goes back and forth. Well, let me get a light meter. I said, no, no, you got to learn what it's like without a meter. And once you can do it without a meter, then you can use a meter. <laughs> but you can't use a meter until you don't need it, which I always thought that was a great concept. And that's the whole thing about understanding, you know, this is the East Room of the White House, Richard Nixon resigning um, in the era of terrible artificial light films. This is high speed ectochrome type B, which was 160 ASA, terrible, awful film, but it was pretty much all we had. And you know, if you had that loaded in your camera and all of a sudden you ran outside to see the helicopter go, you had to change because the film was balanced for indoor light and looked terrible outdoors. It was way before you could just do shift command I and it would, or L and automatically get the levels right, you know, which is what we do now. This was uh, by um, early uh, 73, I became a Kodachrome guy. Kodachrome and Tri-X was for the next, 15 years, um, that was pretty much my diet. And then eventually a little bit with Elvia, the Fuji E6 film. This is Ronald Reagan, who, uh, you know, I've done a lot of stuff with the presidents along the way. And this was when Reagan was running back in 1980. And now there's a, there is a story. <laughs> there was a story that I was asked to recount here. So this was a bilateral, meaning there was US and the Soviets. It was uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, newly uh, uh, the leader of the Soviet Union, and Ronald Reagan, who had been for five years the uh, president of the United States. And there had been a lot of, you know, Soviet US tension pretty much at all levels. And they decided this would be their first summit meeting in Geneva. And I went kind of on my own. I found it, I co-founded an agency in the mid seventies called Contact Press Images with uh, a French Englishman named Robert Pledge. We kind of were using the gamma sigma model. We would go do stuff just because we wanted to do it. And in almost any case for 20 years, 25 years, everything we did ended up in some magazine. The last 15 years have been kind of tough because the magazine business is 
changed so much. But this was one of those situations where I was going. Time Magazine alone had sent four photographers on his trip. And so the thing you had to know is that in these bilaterals, the protocol people would give each side the same number of photo passes or press passes. And I think it was like a dozen for each country. Well, the US probably had 15 photographers and a couple of the wire service photographers knew they weren't gonna go into this final press conference and meeting. But the Soviets, they had Pravda, Tass, and maybe one official guy. I knew that the Soviets had six, eight, maybe 10 extra passes beyond what they need. I couldn't get it from the Americans, but I went to the Soviets and um, I didn't get into the whole thing about how my great grandfather had left Russia. I skipped that part. He basically <laughs> just said, I'm a, I'm a photographer. I've worked in Moscow. I really had a great time there. And if you have an extra pass, I would love for you to you know, share that with me. And I promise I will photograph Mr. Gorbachev as well as anybody. And so he said, well, you must be, you must be patient. Are you gonna get the whole story here? So you must be patient. So I sat down a little chair and I'm thinking at 3.15, they were gonna close the door and it's like five minutes to three. So I'm sitting, you know, like da -da 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 -da, my fingers on the chair and it's like, I kind of lean forward 10 minutes to three, I said, no, 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 like three o'clock. And he's like, please, you be patient. Finally, at like nine minutes after three, he says, my friend. And he hands me a pass and he says, you know, you can be very patient. <laughs> and I said, you are correct, sir. And I got into the room. And when I got into the room, I'm looking up at the stage and I see that the chairs are about maybe a meter or a meter and a half apart. And Gorbachev here and this like Grand Canyon and then Reagan. And so, and uh, Klaus Peter, I hope you'll appreciate this. I said to Larry Downing, who was then working for Newsweek and another one of the wire service photographers, fellas, I think we need to do a light reading. And so we say to the Secret Service guys guarding the stage, so we got to go do a reading. And we, and we only do incident readings. We don't do any of this reflected light stuff. So we get up there and, every, and we're all standing around. It's like, well, what do you got? About a buck and a quarter, three, five? Well, what do you got? 400 or 800? What are you shooting at? And we're just like basically bullshitting with each other. And as we do this, we're slowly pushing the chairs closer together so that the chairs ended up being about a foot apart. And I always, when I tell that story, I always have to say that I'm in the, my whole life has been spent trying not to interfere with the events that I cover, but every now and then you need to be getting the chairs close enough to fit them into a 180. So <laughs> that was uh, the truth behind the summit meeting. And this picture never got used because the feeling of uh, perestroika and peace and friendship, Mary Druzhba, big deal at this meeting, but it looked like it was full of suspicion. So nobody used the picture until they had another meeting about six months later, which was much more hard edge and my fin picture finally was used. Next. Um, Larry King, who just passed away a couple of weeks ago on the left with Bill Clinton and Al Gore at the time of the 1992 uh, presidential race. And again, you arrive at the last minute. This was done at the Florida State Fair. So it's outdoors and a bunch of lights. And I might have had a one degree meter to read, or I probably just bracketed like 125 at 35. And I love this picture because it's really a, a further reminder that sooner or later, all politics is about the hair. <laughs> Go ahead, next one. Al Gore, eight years later, running for uh, president against George W. Bush in the year 2000. And the Sunday before, I can still remember this very clearly. The Sunday, now go back one. The Sunday before the, um, the election, I had just started using a Holga. So I had a roll of Tri-X in there and I was hand holding 
a red filter in front of it, waiting for him to uh, raise his hand and think. And as we walked away, one of the other photographers said, you know, you could probably tape that filter onto that Holga. I thought, wow, there's a uh, really great idea since of course the Holga just had, had no screw. I mean, it was plastic, so there was no way to screw a filter in there, but tape a filter on, what a brilliant idea. <laughs> okay, next one. Um, this is a Polaroid and let's just have a moment of silence for type 55, which mm -hmm. was one of the great films of the 20th century. Uh, this is the funeral of Ronald Reagan. Uh, he's lying uh, in the rotunda of the US Capitol and shot with a sheet of, um, on my four, by now I'm shooting with the four by five speed graphic. And it was the kind of thing where I'd take the dark slide out of, I always carried an extra dark slide. And that was like my shutter when it was really dark and you're shooting with an ASA 50 film at F2.8 and the lens is cranked a little bit and you open the shutter with the black um, uh, dark slide there and that's like one second, two second, boom. And that's your shutter. This is like a two second exposure. I wanted to get the movement of the people as they walked around the room. Go ahead. Burnett and film, I think, uh, yeah, okay, this was, continuing to shoot with my speed graphic, which some few of you may know this from the, uh, the, the Dancing with Speeds uh, page on Facebook, which were originally, uh, I shot a bunch of pictures in 2004 and I won a prize in world press photo, sports pictures with my four by five and this, Another wonderful, crazy photographer, a guy named, uh, uh, what's his first name? De Vries, John DeVries, a Dutchman who was a commercial photographer, but he had seen that this stuff was shot with a large format camera as this was. And he tracked me down when I came to Amsterdam and he started a web page dedicated to what he called the Burnett Combo, speed graphic and arrow ektar lens. And I wanted something that would give me some speed because with an F2.8 and Tri-X inside my speed graphic, I could shoot it at a 30th at 2.8 or a 50th at 2.8 and shoot it as if it was a 35 millimeter film camera. So that's what this, this picture here is uh, Barack Obama on the campaign plane in 2008. Uh, Kodachrome of Diana Spencer on her way to marrying Prince Charles in the early 80s outside of St. Paul's, shot with a 400, a, uh, another Kodachrome of um, the Gordon Bennett balloon race in Paris, 1983. First time it had been held in 50 years and, and this big gray storm and I see this one balloon go up and now the, all you gotta do is pay attention, the pictures are there. In 1983, the US sent troops into the island of Grenada and the Caribbean. And after like four days of walking around, it's hot, it's sweaty. Um, um, I think by then I may have been shooting Velvia, I'm not sure, but this, oh, this might be Kodachrome. I'm walking up a hillside and I just kind of look over to my right and I see all these guys from the 82nd Airborne sitting around outside this house. And I did the one thing you're probably not supposed to do is I grabbed my 50 millimeter lens on a, I think a T90 Canon. I whipped around and I saw him and I just said, don't anybody move, which is not always the smartest thing to say to a platoon of soldiers, but they all kind of looked at me like, what in the hell are you doing? That was my picture. Just trying to be fast enough to catch what's in front of you. That's the struggle. In 1994, at the 50th anniversary of D-Day, um, a bunch of World War II veterans who were then about the same age that I am now in their early 70s, uh, decided they wanted to jump again in France in the same place they had jumped 50 years earlier. And this was one of the uh, guys and his, him walking off the field. This was in Santa Barbara and Kodachrome in the early 80s. It was Ronald Reagan's adopted hometown and I was just wandering around one morning and saw this guy 
I don't know what he was doing, but sometimes you just see a picture and got to take it. Next one. Uh, this was on the USS Eisenhower aircraft carrier, a lone Marine walking on the uh, deck of the aircraft carrier, stormy afternoon, Kodachrome 200, another great film, great film. <laughs> Fu Min Sha, a, um, the Chinese diver. I always ended up going for good pictures and I almost never got the winners. I, at the Olympics, I never got the medalists. This is the one time that I got the gold medalist doing a gold medal dive. And she was um, going on the 10 meter platform when they had built this wonderful swimming pool into the side of the mountain in Barcelona. So you had the whole city spread out below. And there's a million pictures of this dive where she's kind of doing a jackknife and turning this way. And as far as I know, I'd like to say I was like, really on it, but it was pure luck. I was one of those machine gun moments when you're like, butta, 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 butta. And one of the pictures is the picture. You never know when that's gonna happen sometimes. This is at the pen relays. I got into shooting sports with large format cameras in the late nineties and into the early 2000s. This was shot with a Mamiya 7 with the 43 millimeter lens. And as I, with the uh, Rolla Tri-X, once again, the standard of my life, this is one of those pictures that if you don't know anything about track, this is the part where the pole vaulter is coming down. Cal Ripken, who is an American baseball player and who in 1995 uh, played in his 2,131st consecutive game without missing a game over like 11 seasons and it was a new record. And I had tried to get on the field with all the other photographers and they wouldn't let me on the field. So I had to hide out up in the stands. Sometimes fate treats you very well. I got, I think a much better picture not being down there with everybody else. Okay, into the last couple of pictures here next. Another diving picture from my, this is a four by five at the White House with my Liberator and a couple of digital cameras. And the green bag on my shoulder is, if, you're, if you ever served in the army, you've probably seen a Claymore mine bag. They fit four by five holders perfectly. And uh, you can get eight of them in one of those Claymore mine bags, highly recommended. The day, actually the two days before the first impeachment hearings were gonna start in November of uh, 2019. So just over a year and a, like a year and a half ago, not even a half. Um, the end of World War I uh, anniversary parade took place in New York. So this was November 11th, about 11 in the morning, you know, to honor the armistice of 1918. And a group of reenactors, came in, they, uh, they formed up after they had marched all the way up Fifth Avenue and one of their people was gonna take pictures and I, and he got a couple of shots and I ran over and I said, wait, don't anybody move yet. And handheld with this little camera and popped in a couple of sheets and I made this frame of the, uh, of the Doughboys and then there were some people, all, some civilians dressed up, next picture. Uh, civilians dressed up in the same kind of, um, uh, I would say the same period. And I just shot a picture of them. And there's something so sweet about shooting with this old camera when you're basically shooting one picture. I mean, that's what it comes back to. You're not shooting with your finger taped onto the shutter button. You're gonna try and get it to make your one photograph. And I think I have one more of the Liberator at, this is CNN, me with my Julius Caesar haircut at the first day of the uh, hearings. And, um, but you know, the camera, the TV camera is way in the back of the room. And these are the, the first witnesses showing up. And I knew I had to be fairly close because this is like the equivalent of an A, like a 
50 millimeter on a 35 millimeter camera. So you have to be kind of in the ballpark to get a picture. And then last but not least, I think there's a picture of Colonel Vindman, who was one of the witnesses taken with this camera. So voila. Wow, we are more than speechless, to be honest. That was <laughs> wow. that was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah. 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 I have to say one of my favorite quotes that I've heard from you is that you you're making your photos for the future so that you feel like people when that they'll know what the 20th century was about. And um, I feel like that's something that all of us here on the panel have in common in one way or another, that we're really trying to carry something through to the future and make sure that it stays available. Yeah. yeah. I think Maybe that's yes. really what the, that's what the power of photography is. I mean, I always talk about it as to me, photography is memory and it can become the memory or the system memory or the memory of a civilization it's probably stronger than well maybe a really great writer but most of us aren't great writers but what i and the one thing i always this is kind of my new thing for the last couple of years when i anytime i share whatever i try and share about photography is to remind people that don't just photograph that world out there that is the story that you're like in case of me as a as a magazine photographer yeah i'm doing politics and sports i'm doing these things that are stories but do not forget to photograph your own life and your family and your pets and your friends and all the little the little stuff in your life because in now i've been doing this over 50 years i can tell you that in 20 or 30 years those pictures are the ones that will have so much more meaning than whatever we do looking out it's the stuff that we do looking into ourselves and photographing our own lives that I think will be by far the most important and the most meaningful. Yeah. Absolutely. I think Yuho was just saying he just made a picture of his dog, right? <laughs> I don't have a well, dog, true. but, but really? like... <laughs> but maybe I dreamed it. <laughs> but, but, I, just yeah. shot, yeah. I just shot two pictures of my dog. Oh, this, it was an hour ago. <laughs> yeah, you can confuse you know, us dogs, very easily. <laughs> You know what they say, dogs are better than ants because you don't have to lean down so far to pet them. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I do have a kind of a memoir. I have my father's Nikon FE2. He bought it from Hong Kong when he, he was moving to Bangladesh to do some NGO work for in 88. And then oh, when I was really? uh, se seven years old or something, we visited the Grand Canyon. And uh, I remember him giving it to me, like, and giving it to my hands and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, telling me that, okay, what do you want to remember? Um, and then, uh, and it was, he used to do only slide films. So there was some Belvia in it or something. Mm -hmm. So the chances of a seven-year-old getting the picture right uh isn't they aren't super high exactly right. i mean it's a, it's a pretty automatic camera but the idea of him you know trusting me with uh that the memories was was something that kind of really really has set up me in in this journey of of actually saving these cameras because it's not 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 just like, I mean, I can give a digital camera to my kid and say that, yeah, blast away. There is nothing special about it. But if I, I give a, a film camera, then, then they know to wait. And uh, I've done that several times. So, so it's, a, it's a bit, it's a different world. This may be also well, a good I'm, I remember my first camera was a Brownie Holiday. And there was something about the act. It was a very studied act of turning the knob and waiting for the dots be, to become that number and the little red window. I mean, that was, it was not a time of gaspillage. You know, you would have one roll of film that would last for a whole trip or a, several weeks or a month or two. 
And so it started to have a much more personal, every time you push that shutter button, as it should, was a real moment to try and make something of it. That's also a good time, I think, now to come into the discussion because our second part normally, uh, today I think we just get out of our format in the standard way, but it was <laughs> tremendous what we have seen. It's, uh, I think it's, it's definitely, it was worth to go this way. Um, but I think we should now start a little bit in the discussion because we have here different generations we have different uh, ways of uh, representing the, the, um, the community. Maybe there's something that, especially the younger guys uh, like uh, Juha and Nick um, would think to those who are a little bit older, I'm sorry, like, like Peter and, uh, and David. So maybe that could be an interesting thing about what do you think about photography or what do you wanted to ask? Um, yeah, if, selfishly, if I could ask uh, uh, David a question. Um, so uh, as an American, your portfolio is especially, uh, I guess, near and dear to me because you it's just rich with, I don't want to say the word Americana because that makes it sound cliche and, and cheesy, but it, it's, it, it's so rich with um, American history and uh, moments that, um, you know, are so iconic to like my generation, but we didn't get to experience except through your photos. Um, but so many of your photos, you approach with a, a more creative um, look than a lot of photojournalists do. And I was kind of curious if you had to fight for that freedom to, to shoot things a little more creatively, a little soft focus, or like, you know, the pictures you took in Katrina, for instance, the aftermath of that, they're very soft focus with heavy vignettes and, um, mm -hmm. I don't get the sense that many photojournalists are granted that kind of freedom to, to be that creative in their visual style. Well, I had, uh, that's, a, that's a really good point. I mean, the one thing about having my own agency meant that I could pretty much go out and kind of do it the way I wanted to do it. You're always trying to keep the editors happy. Like that's the first thing you do is to get the have to do stuff. But then it's like from there, uh, shooting for Geographic on the Katrina, the aftermath of the Katrina hurricane, it was a bit of a struggle to get them to understand that I was gonna shoot four by five color as well as uh, with my uh, 5D uh, digital cameras. And that they would, you know, that they would be able to get the stuff processed in the early, you know, like in 2006, which is when that was, they still had a photo lab. So it wasn't a gigantic stretch, but I was having trouble getting their supply people to have enough film. Like you say, send me 200 sheets of film or something. Well, we don't have to, I said, come on, you don't have 200 sheets. You're the National Geographic, call Fuji, call Kodak, get some film. But it was, um, I think, you know, it's really interesting that you say that. I know that I wanted to shoot that with the four or five, and I think they must have probably had something like that in mind when they called me. It's, it's not something that we ever talked about other than I said, yeah, well, I'm, I plan on taking the big camera as well as the 35s. And they were pretty cool with it. And then they were really happy with what we ended up getting. So it, it was, it doesn't, I'll say this, it doesn't always work. I had a big fight. A year later, I had another, got another assignment from them to do a story on Orlando, like Orlando, Disneyland or Disney World. Um, what else is there? Oranges. Well, it used to be oranges. Now it's fancy big houses. But you, like a week ago, it was an orange grove. Now it's a house. And um, it was this big city that was uh, in the shadow of all this Disney and vacation stuff. And I wanted to shoot everything with, I was kind of really into the four by five deal. And my editor was like, well, I'm not gonna, I can't show that. I said, you gotta show this stuff. And it was the, and she was a really good editor but she didn't wanna show any of that edgy, more edgy looking stuff. And in the end, I insisted that at least get looked at and half of them are, are what ended up getting used. So it was, it was a battle worth fighting for. Um, but it's, it's true that there are so many things that you can, you know, what I, what I do love about, you know, there's nothing, 
like this camera, there's nothing amazing about it. It doesn't have a look so much as it might look like our grandparents' pictures from 1948 when they went to Canada and looked at the snowy mountain or something. But there is something in the act of shooting with one of these cameras that I think is, is great. There isn't anybody watching this now that wouldn't do well to if they don't already have some kind of digital camera, a, a film camera, rather film camera, to you know spend an extra the eighth day of your week, just put a roll of Tri-X in an old knob wind Leica and go see how hard it was for Henri, Henri Cartier Bresson and Duano to shoot those cameras before the introduction of the M3 when you had the quick, you know, the thumb wind. Those, yeah. I think uh, it's a 531-2, Will. Uh, um, I'm sure the price is on eBay. I just exploding at the moment. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, they've gone up to $9 or something. No, I mean, they're, they're actually, they're, there, is, there is a whole re, uh, renaissance of, of interest in these cameras. I mean, I looked at one. I had this camera with me at um, Exposure, the big Sharjah and the United Emirates two years ago. And uh, Don McCullen saw me goofing around with it. McCullen's got all these Mamiya universal cameras that he uses for his landscape work. He's, a, he's really a film guy at heart. And he was like, oh, that's, that's pretty nice. Well, it's pretty good. And I, at one point I offered it to him at breakfast and he was like, no, no, I couldn't do that, couldn't do that. So I came home and I found one on eBay for 110 bucks or whatever. And they said, well, where do you want it sent? And I said, it goes to uh, Don McCullen. <laughs> and he was just kind of blown away that this little antique camera that was older than even he was, because he's a little older than I am. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm about two years younger than my lenses. Just <laughs> one question, the, the, um, the light meter you used, uh at between Gorbachev and Reagan, was that a Gossen or? You know what, I have to think that by then I was using the Minolta flash meter for oh. that kind of, okay. well, I'm sorry, you asked me a question, I cannot lie. <laughs> okay, just take, I was like, we're having uh, technical difficulties. No, I mean, it was, yeah, the, I'll tell you the great thing about the, the flash, the Minolta flash meter, and this is just what everybody who used it believed, and this is why it's important to know this for future design and marketing issues. When you, when you would hit the button and it would say uh, F6.3 or whatever it was, you, you didn't have to worry about that going away. It would stay lit. And if like in 10 minutes, I can't remember what it was, and you look at it, it would still say something on there. It didn't recycle back to nothing. And then you had to take another reading. So little, little detail unbelievable time i mean you just never needed to change the battery with the minolta right yeah. uh, i have a question to both uh, basically now that i'm I, i'll start the marketing for the school uh, I'll, i'll have to somehow uh well obviously there is the big uh, kind of um responsibility for telling someone that hey you start now and this will probably be something that you can do in the decades to come like because that's the whole point if you do three years of of learning something you want to do it for decades so like uh, for david as an artist do you feel that it's uh, like important to keep film cameras going and just so that Uh, Klaus Theater is also uh, like as an engineer do you feel that it's you know we've been talking about the importance of buying new ones and with light meters we can do that but do you feel that as an engineer there is an importance in in keeping these old masterpieces uh, alive and could like <laughs> is, it, is it worth giving eight guys that that you know the making them do a life decision basically class can start yeah uh, i think it's it's worth uh, for sure 
I have several of these old cameras and I have, I think, uh, the same as uh, David has in his hands. Not the big one, but the small ones. And uh, I also love the, uh, the mechanical uh, cameras which are behind. Um, so I collected some of them. Um, not the most expensive, but uh, some from ACFA, uh, like the Colart. And uh, they are very beautiful if they, you take them in the fingers. And I can also um, have the same opinion um, what David uh, told. If you make one picture, um, it's done. And uh, you don't have to make hundreds of pictures because that's uh, what uh, today happens with the uh, digital uh, way. You make hundreds of pictures, maybe you uh, post 20 of them uh, because you cannot decide uh, what is the best one. And uh, I had an idea with the digital photographers because uh, I'm also photographing digital. Uh, the best thing if you uh, want to take a 128 megabyte um, uh, memory card inside, then you have exactly maybe 10 pictures or less. And uh, that would uh, be a little bit uh, the behavior like photographing on film. You are limited and you have to think about before. So I think it's always worth uh, to repair these old things. Um, we have also the, the old light meters, uh, which work very perfect in, in a lot of cases. And uh, we would repair it if we had the, the knowledge and we have the material for it. So, but it's, it's really, it was in the past time, it was difficult to make the repairs because uh, they struggled in other points and then uh, it's inconvenient for the customers. Especially say one little, I'd say one little thing about light metering. I went through when I was in my, maybe my early twenties, I had this moment where I realized that um, well, with my Luna Pro, you, you had the little white thing that would slide across the front for, you know, and you could either do reflected light. When, you, when you've grown up, you understand that incident is the way to meter. And you don't always have the ability to, if somebody's, you know, 50 meters away, then you have to kind of mimic whatever that is. But I felt like I had grown in stature of my own being when I understood the difference between reflected light and incident light. And that probably sounds really stupid, but um, it won't be the stupidest thing I say today, but I, there is an understanding of how light falls on the subject. And that is really what it comes down to for me. It's not what, it, I mean, it is really what it looks like from a distance, but it, how the light arrives there? What is the light arriving on that place? And most people don't un really understand the difference when they're just starting out. And that is something that when you finally the light bulb goes off, that it's an incident light bulb. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the main uh, application where you use uh, the light meter is uh, the incident and not the reflected. If you take the reflected light metering, it's uh, like you take the meter in the camera. And uh, if you take the uh, incident light metering, I think it's, it's the best way uh, to use the light meters. And I see two main applications. Uh, one is uh, the incident light metering, which is really perfect. Um, black is black and white is white, uh, if you make this measurement. And in the case of the reflected light metering, uh, you always get that what is reflected. And light meters are normally calibrated that the say, okay, that what I get uh, to see or what I see is uh, the medium gray. And if you have black and you make the reflected light metering, it's gray. And if you have white uh, and you make the reflected light metering, it's also gray. So uh, to get black and white, uh, usually, uh, let's say in the um, marriage photography and, and so on, um, it's uh, sometimes better to meter the light which is falling on the scene and not the light which is reflected from the scene. So that's we one have of here a few questions coming in. Yeah. I think not only a few, we're just bombarded with questions because we have such a great <laughs> panelist here. Um, there was one to Klaus Peter um, about his thoughts about um, Chinese 3D printed light meters, which are flooding the market uh, for very little money. What is your opinion about that? <laughs> 
Uh, the Chinese, what Chinese uh, like me this? Well, you have these cubes, <laughs> which are for, I, I'm sure you have seen them in the past. And uh, yes. Uh, so um, let's say it a little bit from the experience. Uh, we have a small light meter as well. It's a TG6, uh, which Marwan uh, likes and uh, has in his pocket every time when he's going out. And um, I see that uh, if you want to make a light meter, you have to have uh, some experience. It's not only uh, getting uh, the meter and uh, getting a photo diet and uh, then uh, getting some uh, measurings. Um, it's a little bit more behind. And uh, we have also a calibration laboratory where we can calibrate and do everything. And I think uh, they are very nice, these uh, little light meters which are placed on, on the top. It's a little bit a copy of our meters that we finished in uh, 1950. So we had some for Leica, uh, which were placed on top and uh, Gossen and Metravat uh, are fusionated. Uh, and so Metravat has also a history of these light meters. And I know the 60, which was from Gossen, it was a small one, which you can put on the camera shoe. So I see this uh, light meters. Um, I don't have them checked, yeah, uh, but um, it's, it's, let's say it's a, it's a market. Uh, you can get this uh, Chinese tools, try it out and make your own decisions if it's worth uh, to spend the money on it. Or if you get one from the experienced uh, people on the market, uh, you have normally two um, reasonable brands. One is Gossen. I think there was one question in the chat as well, uh, whom I'm representing. So I'm representing the Gossen meters. And uh, the other one is Seconic. Uh, that's uh, one of our main competitors. And they are doing a really good job in the US, uh, for instance. And uh, we are more oriented, oriented in Europe but we have also some different brands uh, in US or some different models which were especially made in the past time for the US market. Nowadays, we have uh, the complete uh, portfolio and it's the same in Europe and in US. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We have a question for Nick. Um, Nick, what's the most exciting or promising new product for film photography that you have tried or been exposed to recently? Um, I, uh, I don't tend to try a whole lot of new products. I'll be honest. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> uh, I kind of rely on my old cameras and, um, you know, my, uh, my old equipment. I, I, I know there's so many great products coming out for, you know, scanning your film with a digital camera and, um, you know, things along those lines and new meters and, and everything. And, um, I, I don't tend to embrace them too much because I'm, Guess I'm kind of stubborn in my ways. Like once I find equipment that works for me, I tend to just just kind of stick with it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's been amazing to see just how the community just keeps growing and growing and growing. And there's new new products. I mean, I, I remember a time when that was just that was never going to happen. Like it, I, f film was dead, and no one shot it, and there certainly wasn't going to be any new new stuff coming out related to it. But it seems like there's a new product every month now. Um, the thing that's kind of most exciting to me is the, the new four by fives that people are doing. So, I mean, there's, you know, I, I follow a guy on Instagram who's uh, an Italian, you know, maker who makes these just beautiful four by five cameras that are called like Stino Peca, I think. And, um, there's, it's like, there's these little just isolated pockets of people who see a need for something, or they're just you know, beautiful craftsmen and they want to make a good camera. They want to make a good meter. They want to make a good, whatever, um, to try and fill a, a void. Um, and it's nice seeing all that, all that new stuff come out. Um, I just, uh, I tend to be slow to change. I'm kind of a, a large ship when it comes to, um, changing, changing course, but, um, uh, yeah, lots of great products out now. I just quick ask Nick, what, What's your like main squeeze camera system these days? Um, I shoot a lot of six by seventeen, so I uh, oh. have a view camera six by seventeen. It's a field camera um, made by Shenhao, and that's really my my favorite camera because I get all the movements of uh, of you know traditional large format, and um, but 
something about the six by 17 format um just really appeals to me very cinematic a roll film back yeah roll yeah choose 120 mm-hmm. that's cool yeah yeah and i used to have a a roll film back six by 17 adapter for a four by five which is that's one of those products where it seems like there's a new company coming out with that every so often and um that worked great for a while but then i just wanted a dedicated uh six by 17 camera and i, I absolutely love that camera and um mm-hmm. Uh, Mamiya C220 is probably my my favorite medium format right now. A little TLR, yeah, I, I really what like is, using and that. What is your like? You've been doing this long enough. What film do you miss the most that you can't find anymore? Um, I never got to try Kodachrome, and that's always been sad for me. <laughs> but uh, and the you mentioned um, you know Type 55 film i never got to try that either and i would love to try that i've used new 55 which is the latest you know um iteration of that and it's really not the same film it can't be the same film because they don't have the the chemicals anymore and that's a lot of fun to work with but when i see like you know some type 55 stuff you know from your portfolio or whoever else i mean i would love to try that that's just uh it's i wish i I started early enough that i could have tried kodachrome and i just went right into fuji i was shooting velvia and provia Mm -hmm kind of right off the bat and I just never but back then you didn't think anything was going to die out Kodachrome was going to be here forever so never got to try it but I would have loved to try that that's uh I had my wife was involved in the state department in the during the Clinton years and uh occasionally she'd get invited to some kind of a state dinner or some sort of a fancy governmental dinner one night it was a big uh, we got seated I, I would go with her I'd dress up and go with her uh at the National Art Gallery, a big table. And at the table was like the number three guy at Kodak. And I, I uh, this would have been about 95 or 96. When, you know, living in New York, we still had the Kodachrome processing out in New Jersey at Fairlawn, which meant you could get it in like 24 hours. That was like, they had the, uh, the fleet messengers would pick it up in the morning, get it out there. You might even get it back that evening. That was amazing. But there was this crazy photographer named Richard Maxson, who had been a Sports Illustrated photographer for 20 years, went to work as a tech guy at uh, Kodak and basically invented a uh, machine that would process Kodachrome and that was the size of like a small sofa instead of like a building. It was just this thing with like a few tanks. And I knew about it, but it was still kind of a hush-hush thing. And I said to this Kodak guy, I said, geez, you know, I understand you have, uh, you know, industrial espionage. I understand that there is a way that you guys could actually uh, get like two-hour Kodachrome turnaround that basically every lab in the country could have same-day Kodachrome. And he, and it like, you could just see this is like one of the great geniuses that was showing off at that moment why Kodak just crumbled into a nothing company. Well, we don't have that much demand for Kodachrome anymore. And I said, well, let me just explain to you as a Kodachrome photographer, even Kodachrome photographers eventually want to see what their film looks like. (laughs) And, you know, waiting a week just doesn't cut it in the era of Velvia in an hour. Well, yes, I don't really think that, you know, we're Kodak. And it was like all the smart people had their slide rules and their chemical beakers in the back room and the idiots were running the company, like so many companies, like Polaroid, for that example. It's, we are just, just breaking it's too bad record. because we are above the two hours now. Yes. <laughs> I want to try to get in another couple of questions yeah. here. We have one for you, maybe you just yeah. ask him. <laughs> uh, somebody is wondering, Yuho, what's your opinion? There's a lot of uh, inflation on the film cameras right now. Do you think this trend is going to some set some sort of a cap on the growth of the community? Uh, well, not quite yet. I mean, the, the big issue is that we need a lot of people to start digging uh, into attics and and try to find cameras um, because they're they are available somewhere, but they're just not in the market. 
Um, and the second reason is that there's a lot of compact cameras and Minolta autofocus cameras and Canon EOS autofocus cameras that are still very, very cheap and they they will stay cheap. I mean, even like a fully tested one you, you get for like 30 euros or 50 euros. So it's it's still like, it, it's not uh, the days of buying a Nikon FM2 for a hundred euros anymore. Uh, like it, it's not, it, it's gonna stretch out and good cameras will become rarer and rarer and hopefully people will start to kind of value the camera according to the condition, not according to the name of the camera, because uh, there's quite a lot of like, um, especially collectors that try to, to sell to us the perfect cameras because they were perfect when they put them in their collection in 92. Uh, and then uh, it's like 90% of them don't work the way they're supposed to anymore. And then they check eBay pricing and say that, okay, I need to get 20% under eBay pricing uh, for each of them. And then it's, it's a, basically a deal that cannot be done by anyone. Uh, but uh, basically, it's, there's quite still a lot of room to, to grow if, if people start moving. Well, there is one important question we got very often. Um, that's to David. Um, who is getting your negatives? development wow that that be, that was a topic a at question. dinner last night and uh i don't know i'm i'm actually uh in the process as a lot of my generation are of trying to figure out you know where is it all going to go my my agency uh we've been around for 40 what 44 years something like that um from 1975 until about 2005, it's one of the more amazing 30 year documents of the history of the world in pretty much all continents. And trying to find a home for that film is, is challenging because it's, it's a lot of stuff. It would require a lot of um, uh, you know, interest in trying to get um, get it really looked after and well cared for. And as you know, I, I have a number of friends who are all in the same boat. We're all trying to figure out the answer to that and no one's figured it out yet. Yeah, we've I don't know, that. I wish I had an answer, I don't. All right. Well, you know, I could just sit here and kind of chat with you guys for another two hours, but um, we kind of already doubled the length that we said we were going to. So I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up. We apologize to everybody whose questions we didn't get to today. But um, yeah, we really appreciate that, that you were here and uh, that you all joined us. And a huge thank you, huge, huge thank you to all of our panelists for being here. And um, it's really been such a joy. Yeah. Um, we just wanted to say to everybody that uh, this is going to be our last for now fireside chat. It's not that we won't do any more, but we're not going to keep doing them every two weeks. Um, I mean, in the first place, spring is coming. So everybody <laughs> doesn't want to be sitting around by the fireside chatting. They want to be going out and shooting more film. Um, but we are also planning to start our new podcast, um, which will be running regularly, um, the Silver Grain Connection podcast that's going to be hosted together with Eric Schlickspia. Um, and it will give us a chance to have one guest go into topics um, more in depth. And so we would be very pleased if any of our panelists today would come back and be our guests on the podcast. And then we could go two hours with just one of you. And I'm sure it would also <laughs> that be- That is the next project. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that would also be great. But um, it's just been a wonderful time. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope that everybody stays safe, stays healthy in the meantime.
And um, we will definitely be letting everybody know when we're going to be doing the next fireside chat. Um, Just follow us on Instagram and Facebook. There we will announce daily something new. Uh, and uh, especially when the podcast and the new fireside chat will come out. It will not be that far uh, from now. But we have to plan it. It's coming. Right. So exactly and we'll also be sending out a mailing to everybody who signed up so you will definitely be notified and we would be very very happy if you joined us so thank you for joining us today thank you especially to all the panelists you've been wonderful and uh yeah stay safe take care thank you bye thanks bye, bye. Good to meet you all thank you likewise <laughs>